Well, good morning to you guys. Having a great morning. You guys are fired up this morning, aren't you? What a great day uh, to be in God's house. What an awesome time. And I just appreciate every single person that came to God's house this morning. It was your day off, I know, and everything's closed down, and, but you came to God's house. Some of you took showers, praise God. Got your kids cleaned up, got to God's house on time, and I just think that's exceptional behavior in today's culture. Um, I, I read a statistic that 50% of America was planning on going to church uh, this Sunday morning. And uh, I don't know how many plans actually make it there, but you're in the 50 percentile anyways. Give yourselves a hand clap. Amazing, amazing. I want to welcome those who watch on the podcast, the vidcast, the broadcast, however you're tuning in to us this Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. We welcome you. We just encourage you, if you're ever in the Mesa area, come hang out with us. We promise we'll make you feel just like family, won't we? Yeah. Amen. Um, uh, so Don Johnson from Miami Vice called me this morning. And he wants his jacket back. So, there, I said it. Let it go. Yes, and these are Michael Jackson pants. I'm, a, I'm officially the only pastor on Easter Sunday morning in the world that did the moonwalk. That's it. One of a kind. You may go. No, I love that things come around. I love that the 80s are coming back because I'm a child of the 80s, and the 80s are coming back in style, or at least I think they are. (laughs) Or I'm promoting it. I don't know what's going on. It was in the the book of uh, uh, Proverbs, but uh, really emphasized in Ecclesiastes that the wise man Solomon, the wise king, said that there's nothing new under the sun. Things come around, and history tends to repeat itself. We find that in our own lives, that we tend to repeat some of the mistakes that we've made before. And uh, we also look at mistakes that our parents or grandparents made, our pedigree, our heritage. We find ourselves acting in some of the same ways and doing some of the same things wrong. And, uh, but I want you to know that when Jesus came, it was not more of the same. He was not repeating something that had already been done. Before, when he, when he came, see, the Son of God, whom everything was created through, that nothing that is seen was made without him, the creator of the universe and every cell in your body and every breath that you breathe, had to come down here and fix the mess. You kind of almost see him up there going... Oh, don't make me come down there. (laughs) And if he, Jesus, had to become a man and walk in our shoes. See, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We serve a God who got down on the planet and walked in our shoes. And did what we couldn't do, which was to live right and live holy. And nobody ever been done it before. Nobody ever done it since. But he did it. And then he died a sinner's death so that all of mankind's sin, past, present, and future, would die on that cross with him and get buried. And then he resurrected from the dead. What I want to say to you is it must have been a massive problem that he needed to fix and that he fixed it. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Give the Lord a hand clap. That's good. And so we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to start with verse 18. Father God, I thank you and praise you for this morning. I ask the Lord that you'd open up our hearts to receive your word, which is the seed of God. It's your seed, and that it would produce life in us, that it is the incorruptible seed. Holy Spirit, be our teacher this morning and lead us to the things that we need to know Prepare us for the things that are coming in this week. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. If, you, if you're here, you know that I, I, I jump around between the New International Version, the NASB, the NET, and then NKJV. 
Uh, I do read in Greek and, and Hebrew, and so I like to read it in the original language, find the translation that I think best depicts what we're trying to learn, and then use that translation on the screen. So sometimes people say, what do you teach out of? I say, whatever's working in that passage, the best. They all work great. Read all your Bible. Read whatever version you got. It's the life-given Word of God. This is the one that I chose to go with today. All right, so we're starting out 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. Knowing. I love the word knowing. A lot of times you thought you knew something, but you didn't know. And we've got to know the things that God knows because the things that the world teaches us are wrong. So we've got to know something. And so he starts off with knowing. We're going to learn some stuff today, which means I'd want to get out paper and pen if I had or to get out my, my phone with my notes and figure out what God is going to show me today that will carry into my week. Somebody say amen. Because we got to know something different. Knowing that you, he's talking about you. I like it when he talks about me because I know I can apply it to my life this week. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. Redeemed means something had to be paid for. And you weren't redeemed with something that was corruptible like silver or gold, like money. Somebody had to pay. Some, some, somebody's got to pay for the mess that mankind makes on the planet, right? For when we, as mankind, as humans, do something wrong, all the way back to the Garden of Eden when they ate the fruit, God said, look, don't eat from that tree. Don't eat the fruit, all right? Because if you do, then death is coming. So, but man couldn't be obedient. So somebody had to pay. So in the old days, they'd sacrifice a lamb or like a a bird or something, something had to, God would allow something to take the place to bear the punishment for the mess we make, right? So that God and us and our relationship could be restored somewhat. So there was a redeeming that had to happen. What were we redeeming from? From your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers. So in some cases, the conduct might appear good even or bad, the world, the traditions of this world, dictate to us from the time we're born how we should act, what we should believe, how we should talk, what behavior is acceptable or unacceptable. And whatever culture you grew up in, it impacted you in some fashion or form. But it was aimless conduct. And so the aimless conduct has got to be redeemed. But, you know, it was David who said right after he, you know, David... King David, the man that had a heart after God's own heart, he, he stole his friend's wife and killed his friend, Uriah, and, and so had sinned in this great way. And then he said in, in the song, as he was kind of responding to what happened in his life, and he got called out and repented to God for what he had done. Praise God, we serve a God who forgives. Amen. And see, David did some stuff that you, they're a lot worse than most of the stuff you've ever done. And so he repented. But he said this in, in the song that he sang to the Lord. He said, I was born sinful. Right? Even when you're born into this world, we were born sinful. And so somebody got to pay. And we weren't redeemed with stuff where you could give enough money away to make it okay. Where you could do some sort of good deed to earn your, your offset the bad with some good that you did, because it's corruptible, we were redeemed with something else from our aimless conduct. So, so, so conduct. So verse 19, see, if you could buy your way out of the mess that mankind has done before you or that you did yourself, then we don't need a Jesus. But we could not buy our way out of it. <laughs> so he said, you, you could be... So that stuff's corruptible. You can't do that. But we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. He paid. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. This was not a surprise that man was going to mess up. They figured this out long before they created all this. Right long before God created the heavens and the earth, he knew we were going to mess up. 
He's not surprised when you blow it. You think that when you accidentally make a mess, God's like, oh, man, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> wow. But he knew. And so they foreordained this. They, Jesus planned this out. But it happened for us. It was manifest in these last times for you. That doesn't mean he forsook the people that messed up before he came. It says in, in Peter that he went down into the prisons and he plundered the prisons of darkness. Praise God. Who's going to be in prison? Who's going to be in prison down in the earth or wherever they were? And, and Jesus shows up and says, I can get you out of here. And they said, no, I'd like to stay. <laughs> it says that Jesus preached to those who were in prison. But you have an advantage. You get to live out your days on earth with the Redeemer. What a glorious day we have today. Give the Lord a hand clap. We should be excited. So he was manifest in the last times for you who through him, through Jesus, believe in God. Who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Can I just say for a second that what the world teaches and sometimes what's taught in religious places is that Christianity is based on your behavior. How you act is what makes you a Christian or not a Christian. That is not true. Christianity is not about your behavior. It's about what you believe. Your behavior will eventually change. But what we're after, what God's after, is just believe in me. Can you just believe in me? See, see a, a, I don't know, whenever somebody came up with the idea that we evolved, that there is no God and we all evolved, right? And so here's a, here's a picture of the evolution of the iPad. I don't know if you knew that the iPad also <laughs> evolved. It started out as a rock. It became the Ten Commandments. And as it evolved, it eventually became the notebook and then the iPad. Because if you add enough billions of years, an iPad can come from a rock. Look, you are intelligent design. You were designed intelligently. There is a God. He loves you. And to follow him is just to have some faith. It's just to have some faith. It's about believing God. So back to the, the scripture here. Show me, show me verse 23. Having been born again. You know, did you know that the word Easter comes from a German word that means resurrection? It's a myth that's been perpetuated that the Druids invented the word or some, some sort of sacrilege cult invented the word Easter. It's not true. Before that myth came around and that rumor came around, it actually comes from a German word that means resurrection. Yeah, and so you can say happy Easter, it's okay. And we also have like a little, what's the egg have to do with Easter? Maybe more than we think. You know, because an egg symbolizes like a new birth. And when Jesus came, he, he changed everything. And he, he transformed entirely the relationship between God and man. Where it would no longer deal with your behavior, but now it deals with your faith. What he needed to happen is what we're about to see here. Having been born again, that's a, that's a phrase that Jesus invented. We got to be born again. You got born the first time, but there's, an, there's a kind of birth that hasn't happened yet if you haven't received Jesus. And this birth, it's new, and it's to be born not of flesh, but of spirit. And so it's, it defines it here a little bit. This is where I was, I was after today. Not of a corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed. Say incorruptible. incorruptible. You were born again of an incorruptible seed. Incorruptible means it cannot be corrupted. When I was a kid, me and my brother, I was like eight, my brother would be like 11, and if he wasn't hitting me or throwing me down the stairs, we would be playing. <laughs> Love my brother, Scott. And uh, 
we would play like superheroes. Like he'd be Batman, I'm Superman, right? Like Batman versus Superman, the movie or whatever. And we'd be like, and so I'd be like, I'm going to shoot you with my laser eyes. Woo! And he'd be like, I'm blocking it with my shield. And he's like, I'm going to shoot my darts at you. But at some point, if you were playing this game as a kid, and you learned what the word indestructible was, you could have something indestructible. And once you learned the word indestructible, like you were going to win this game. And he'd be like, I'm going to shoot you that I got indestructible skin. <laughs> ting, 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 ting. Doesn't hurt me at all. Indestructible skin. This word incorruptible also means indestructible. Yes. Not corruptible. Wrong. Not destructible. Yes. Not movable, yeah. not beatable, right. not defeatable, yeah. not deathable. Yeah. Come on. That's right. I'll just make up words till you clap. I will. <laughs> but incorruptible seed. Born of a new life. See, under the old system, Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. They're like, hey, you know, don't eat the fruit. And so they're off there talking to a snake. Look, if a snake starts talking to you in a tree, do not do what it says. Like first hint. First hint. And so, and so, but even when there was only one rule on the planet, even there was only one thing they weren't allowed to do, they could do anything they want. There was no other rules. God didn't give them like a list. There wasn't 10 rules. There was one. Just don't eat that fruit. There's no dress code. People so worried about what people wear at church. Look, in the Garden of Eden, no dress code. I'm not, I'm not saying. <laughs> just don't eat the fruit. And we think to ourselves, well, if there was only one rule, I could do it. No, you couldn't. Even with just one rule, you would have ate the fruit. That's what the picture was. And so we get a new start, a new beginning. We get born of an incorruptible seed. But, but God fixed the system. Because he knew that even after being born again, we'd still eat the fruit sometimes. Come on, somebody. Oh, I prayed the other day. I was like, Lord, so far today, I have not sinned. I haven't had one bad thought. I haven't got mad at anyone. I have said nothing wrong today. I have lived a perfect life. Now, as I get out of bed this morning, I just pray. <laughs> And so he created a system where my behavior can't screw it up. See, I said screw it up on this Easter Sunday. He, my ba my, somebody say my behavior, right? My behavior cannot screw it up. It's because it's not based on my behavior. It's based on my faith. My, my behavior will change, but my faith is what secures my eternity. So he did it in such a, he fixed it so that it was an incorruptible seed. The other day I was at uh, Peter Piper uh, Pizza, and they had a pizza lunch buffet. Praise the living God. <laughs> For a man, these are two great words, and when you put them together, it's almost golden streets. You know what I'm saying? Pizza buffet. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, so we're at the pizza buffet, and I've been really watching my health, and that's one of the reasons I was there. It's very, I've been, I have, I don't want to brag, but I've been on a 21-day grace fast. If you don't know what a grace fasting is, it's exactly like regular fasting, except for that you can eat anything you want. <laughs> it's just like fasting, though. And so there I was at the pizza buffet, and if, if you're, if you, I was there with my family, and when you first hit the line, you grab whatever's there. But a veteran pizza buffet person, as you're eating and you're having a conversation, you're still out of the corner of your eye. You're watching for that next batch of fresh pizza. <laughs> right? Because you got whatever was there, and that's fine, and you're having some bites, and you're like with your family. You're like, oh, yeah, that's so funny. But really, out of the corner of your eye, you're like, Oh, yeah. He's pulling pizza out of the oven right now. And you, gotta, and you have to know when to pull the trigger, too, because you don't want to get up too early. You wait until the wheel comes out. When the pizza wheel comes out, then you know you make your move to the line for the fresh, coming out of the oven, cheesy, hot pizza. And so I make my move. I was a little late. I got to be honest. I, I felt like I got beat by some rookies. Two people <laughs> beat me to the fresh pizza line. First guy, he was great, though. I, th I think he may have been a veteran because he grabbed a piece, this, grabbed a piece. That's what you do. You grab a little bit of everything at a buffet. That's the point. It's wonderful. You try a lot of different things. But the lady in front of me, uh, she, was, she was starting to work on, like, a pineapple pizza. And, and at Peter Piper Pizza Buffet, there is no, like, line etiquette, just so you know. I'll just make that announcement now. You can go around people and get whatever pizza you want. But she was standing too close 
to the pizza that I was beginning to covet. Like she was here with the pineapple, but right here was the chicken buffalo with the drizzle of ranch. Hot. I mean, this is like the unicorn of pizza at Peter Piper, too, by the way. You never get chicken buffalo at the pizza buffet. So I was like, and there was one piece missing because the other guy knew, grab a piece of that quick. And, but the, the lady was with the pineapple pizza. I don't know, do, do people do pineapple? What do we, what's with the pineapple? Don't put fruit on a pizza, okay? <laughs> fruit belongs in cake. Put your veggies with the, right, carrot cake. Come on, what are we doing? Don't put veggies in cake. People have got to figure out food, okay. But she's going for the pineapple pizza, and, and the, the pizza wheel didn't get it quite right, so she's using the, the Peter Piper spatula to kind of do the, the jiggle to try and get it to separate from the rest of the pie. Do you know what I'm talking about? But she, her like, technique was all wrong, and she was jiggling too hard. And I saw it coming, and she jiggled, and, and, and the pizza slipped all the way away from the pie and down into that little nasty stainless steel thing they never clean with all the crumbs on it and the stains. And so that piece was gone. Like, you can't touch that now. And it was almost, it's kind of hanging off. And I'm sitting there. All I want is the chicken buffalo pizza. And I'm trying to figure out, can I get around her? What do I do? I'm looking at it. And, you know, the shelf life of the Peter Piper pizza, it's very short. It's like a McDonald's french fry. I mean, you got about 10 minutes to eat that thing, or it starts to taste like, you know, beef jerky or whatever. So... So she's just taking too long, and then one piece, so then she goes for another piece, and she kind of gets it up, but the spatula is too thin, and it starts to lean, and I was like, oh, no, it's going to fall, it's going to fall. And sweat <laughs> has now broken out on my forehead because I just want the buffalo chicken pizza. That's all I want. And she's, and, it, and the pizza, the pineapple pizza, it's, it flops over upside down on the rest of the pie, and then she begins to try and, like, save it, and so she's scooping it from the back, but she's trying to get the toppings back on. It's just taking forever. And I wanted to pray for her. Like at one point, I remember I wanted to like cast the something out of her. And <laughs> so she finally gets the piece on her, her plate. And I thought, okay, I'm ready. It's the, but she, she makes a move, just a small move over to the chicken buffalo, which is what I want. And she, I'm not kidding you now. This actually happened. She took her glasses and went like this. It's a buffet. Even if you don't like it, you could grab it. It doesn't matter. It's all you can eat. Just grab it or don't grab it. But she's kind of eyeing it. So she, she, grabs, she decides she wanted the buffalo. So she grabs the, the spatula, and it comes off nice and easy, and she puts it on her, from the sneeze glass underneath it to her plate. But the cheese was so hot that a strand of cheese made its way all the way from the pie to her, her plate. Okay, and so then she makes a classic mistake. She moves away as though to tear the, but you guys know that doesn't work. When the cheese is that hot, it just stretches longer. So now the, now the cheese, it, it actually goes from here all the way, and it's kind of drooping now. And then still an easy fix, right, would be to take the spatula, cut it off at the pie, Put it on your, that's the, that's the proper etiquette or technique there. She's, but she doesn't, for some reason, she puts the spatula down, and I thought, oh, no. She goes with her fingers, grabs the cheese here, snaps it off, and the cheese dangles all down her arm, under her elbow, and it's kind of flopping there, and then in, in like slow motion, she flings it back, Towards the, this really happened to me, towards the, the pizza that I want, and I watched in horror as the cheese made its way to all of the pizza. There wasn't a single piece that had not been corrupted by the elbow cheese fiasco. That's what it was, it was a fiasco. And she walked away and I just sat there and I couldn't, I couldn't touch the pie. I, I, I had to give up on it. I rejected the corrupted pizza. And here's my point. <laughs> is, is that the world we grow up, we're like that pizza pie. We're perfect, we're wonderful, but the world 
It wants to corrupt us. Darkness wants to get on us. And, and we make messes sometimes. And I want you to know that sometimes man will see us as though there's something wrong with us. The people will look past us. They'll overlook us and they'll reject us because they feel like, and sometimes we feel like we've been tainted by this world, that there's something wrong with us, that how could God ever use me? Because, but I want you to know something, that that which man may reject, God does not reject. You've been born of an incorruptible seed that on the, no matter what the world tries to do to you or tries to put on you or how it tries to mess you up, that the deepest part of who you are is born of Jesus Christ. You were crucified with Christ. The old has passed away. The corrupted cheese that got in your life has been washed clean. It's been dead, buried, and new life was born on the inside of you because Jesus Christ, right? I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. What's on the deepest part of you is incorruptible. And we need to know that, and we need to give God some glory for it. Come on. You see, when Moses was 40 years old, he had killed a man. And after he killed the man, he had to flee his nation. He left alone. He was utterly alone as he walked away, rejected by his culture, rejected by his own family, the Hebrews, rejected by the palace he had to run from the Pharaoh and the family that had raised him and the royalty. Everyone rejected him. He had to flee from that nation. He was all alone. But even though man may have rejected him, we can look at his future and we know that 40 years later, he would stumble upon a burning bush. And maybe where man said, how could God ever use a person that would do something like that? God looked down from heaven. He's not looking for people that are perfect. He's just looking for people that are willing. Come on, somebody. And you too were born of an incorruptible seed. And we worry about our children in this life. There was a study done by James Dobson. He looked into some research. There was a U.S commission that was uh, uh, put in place for child development, all these authorities for child development got together and they did a study and they found, this was in the 90s, they found they were studying young people and teenagers of that day. They wanted to know what was going on with the young people in our country, in America. And they, they wrote this, never before has one generation of American teenagers been less healthy. And I thought, man, they didn't know me when I was a teenager less cared for, or less prepared for life. We look at our culture today. We look at the public school systems. We can look at our country and the, the political turmoil. We can watch a little bit of TV and find out that this world is trying to corrupt people. And we can worry about our, our children as they grow up in this corruption. We can worry about the young people. How are we going to keep them from being corrupted by all this mess that's out there? It's like we act as though Jesus on the inside is so frail and so fragile that we got to keep everything away from the darkness, make sure the darkness doesn't get on us. But I want you to know that the incorruptible seed on the inside of you, and on the inside, when you can get incorruptible seed on the inside of the young people, we don't worry about darkness getting on them, but I can tell you right now that Satan is worried that they're going to get on his stuff that the incorruptible seed is going to start changing and impacting this world. And so we can look at, you know, public school, we look at TV, and we look at, and worry about the corruption of the young people. How are they ever going to be safe? Well, it says in verse 23 of this chapter we were just looking at, that having been born again, first of all, get, some, get Jesus in their hearts. Get the incorruptible seed of God in them. That strengthen them. It's a seed. It's an incorruptible seed. Not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The word of God is incorruptible seed. Jesus said, I am the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh 
and dwelled among us. That's Jesus. He's the Word. He's incorruptible. And He becomes the best part of who we are. In fact, He becomes who we are. He begins to transform us over time into His likeness and image and what He's like as He grows on the inside of us. The Word of God is incorruptible. What's my point? If we can take the time to get more incorruptible on the inside of the young people, more word, what do they need more of if they're going to escape corruption in this world? They need more incorruptible seed. We got to get more on the inside of them. You see, a public school ain't going to destroy them if they're in God's house every week getting incorruptible seed inside of them. Come on, somebody. It can't. It's incorruptible. But it is a seed. I was eating watermelon the other day with my, my son Logan. He's sitting right here on the front row. And, and there was a little black seed. This is when we lived at the other house, Logan. There was a little black seed in the watermelon. And, and I looked at that seed and I saw it as an opportunity. He said, what is that, Dad? It's a little watermelon seed. He said, well, what, what do you mean? I said, well, if you plant this in the ground, it'll grow a watermelon. And so I saw it as an opportunity to teach him about God's ways and seed sowing and this sort of thing. So we took it outside and I found a little spot where like a plant had been growing, but it wasn't there anymore and the dripper was still there though. So I knew it was going to get water and I dug around a little bit and we kind of tilled up the soil and we put that together. We put that seed in the ground. We covered it up. It was going to get sunlight. It was going to get water. It had the earth. It had everything it needed. And the next morning he woke up. He was so excited. He's like, Daddy, let's go look at our plant. But how many know that it wasn't grown yet? It takes some time for the seed to grow. And so I had to explain to him, we got to be patient. We have to take a little bit of time. We're not sure it's going to come up just yet. Well, about six months later, I remembered that watermelon seed we had planted. And, this, and, I, and I, I said to, to, to Logan, I said, Logan, let's go outside and see our watermelon plant. So we walked outside. I knew right where it was. We walked right to the spot where that watermelon seed had been planted. And you know what we found there? Nothing. Because we live in Arizona. And for those of you watching on the stream, it probably got so hot that it blew up into flames or something. I don't know. Because a seed doesn't just need, it needs the right atmosphere. It's got to have the right environment. And the seed of Christ, he said this, it says in Luke chapter 4, that it was the Sabbath, and Jesus was in the synagogue, as was his custom. It was his custom to be in church every Sunday. Praise God. Remember when they were looking for Jesus, his parents were like, well, where is he? And he said, didn't you know I would be in my father's house? The seed of Christ that's within us, it flourishes in God's house. It wants to gather with the other believers. And if we're worried about the young people being corrupted in this world, well, maybe six days a week they're going to get some darknesses, some wrong messages, the aimless conduct and traditions of our fathers is going to try and get on them. But if one day a week they're getting incorruptible seed into their lives, ain't no drugs going to tear them down. Ain't no perversion going to mess them up. But the incorruptible seed will win because greater is he that is within me than he that's in the world. Come on. Praise God. God's so powerful. He says, just give me an hour and a half once a week, and we can get some incorruptible seed on the inside of you and your family. Your marriage needs incorruptible seed so that it doesn't get corrupted. Look, the world system is broken. 50% of marriages, they, they started out, 100% started out right. Nobody wanted to, become, to have it get messed up. Nobody wants to have a bad, bad marriage or a bad relationship or have things break in their life or have a business go down or have a job lost. Nobody wants those things. But I can tell you this, it's a corrupted world full of mess and disease and destruction and the wrong messages and the wrong temptations. And there is a snake in the tree trying to get us to do the wrong thing. Don't talk to him. Come on, somebody. But if we get a lot of incorruptible seed on the inside of us, if we can get incorruptible seed into our marriage, if we can get incorruptible seed into our future, then the corruption of this world will have no place in your life. Somebody say amen. amen. Fill your family up with what is not corruptible. We've got to feed the seed of Jesus Christ that's in us. In the Bible, the seed, the word of God that's here for you, it's incorruptible. But it doesn't mean that everything's going to be peachy every day. Jesus said you're going to have some trouble. 
The incorruptible seed isn't there to make sure that you never have a problem again or that you never make a mistake again. It's there to make sure that you get through the problem or the mistake with a win. Did you know that? See, because Jesus won so that you might have a win for free. If Jesus was blessed so that you might be blessed for free. You're not blessed because you were good enough today or yesterday. And you're not cursed because you were bad enough. Blessings and cursings only come by our faith in Jesus Christ. If we believe in Jesus, then he brought the blessing and he redeemed us from the curse. It's once and for all, and it's a free gift for you if you'll just believe in Jesus today. You see, sometimes there's a storm. And Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to the other side. They got in the boat, but how many of there was a storm between them and the other side? Sometimes Jesus tells you, go this way, but he doesn't tell you about the storm that's between here and there. See, the word of God isn't to make sure there's not a storm. The word of God is to make sure that you can overcome the storm. The incorruptible seed didn't get Daniel to not go in the lion's den. It got him so that the lions couldn't eat him. Come on. The incorruptible seed didn't make it so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't have to go into the fiery furnace. But the incorruptible seed met them in the fiery furnace and made sure that they didn't burn. Come on, somebody. And that's what we need in this messed up world so that we can help fix it. You see, the incorruptible seed is in every book of the Bible. Did you know that? This is the word of God, and it's incorruptible. You come here every Sunday, and I can promise you this. I will give you incorruptible seed for your family and for your future every single week. It's in here. It's in the book of Genesis. He was the seed. Jesus was, was seen. In, the, in, in every single book of the Bible, you can find Jesus. In Genesis, he was the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he was the great I am. In Leviticus, he's the sacrificial lamb. In Numbers, he's the water that came from the rock. In Deuteronomy, he's the daily manna. In Joshua, he's the God of my salvation. In Judges, he's the judge of all the nations. In the book of Ruth, he's my kinsman, redeemer. In 1 and 2 Samuel, he's the anointed king. In Kings and Chronicles, he's the reigning king. In Ezra, he's my builder. In Nehemiah, he's my restorer. And in Ruth, he's my mediator. In the book of Job, he's my ransom. In Psalms, he's my shepherd and the king of all kingdoms. In Proverbs, he's the giver of all wisdoms. In Ecclesiastes, he's the Lord of all the seasons. In Song of Songs, he's the husband of the church, his bride. In Isaiah, he's God with us. In Jeremiah, he was the righteous branches. In Lamentations, the weeping prophet. And in the book of Ezekiel, he's the man with four faces. In the book of Daniel, he's the fourth man in the blazes. In Hosea, he's my faithful provider. In Joel, he's the baptizer of fire. In Amos, he's my burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's the mighty savior. In Jonah, he's rescue from the pit. And in Micah, he's the messenger of beautiful feet. In Nahum, he's my avenger. In Habakkuk, he's the resurrected anointed one. In Zephaniah, he's the taker of my punishment. In Haggai, he's the enthroned priest and the builder of his church. In Zechariah, he's my burden bearer. In Malachi, he's the refiner. In Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, the miraculous. In Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's redemption for the Gentiles. In the book of Romans, he's my righteousness. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he's the unity. My body, the body of church, the body of Christ, and my faithfulness. In Galatians, he's redemption from the curse. In Ephesians, he's the head of a church. In Philippians, he's the supplier of my needs. In Colossians, he's the firstborn over all creation. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he's my soon returning king. In 1st and 2nd Timothy, he's the mediator of a new covenant. In Titus, my faithful pastor. In Philemon, he prepares a room for me in my father's house. In the book of Hebrews, he's the high priest of a new covenant. In James, he's my chief physician. In 1st Peter, he's the sword and written on his thigh is his name king of kings
kings and lord of lords. Come on, somebody, give him glory. Give him praise today. If you want that incorruptible seed in your life, you want what's incorruptible in your life. You're tired of the brokenness of this world. I can tell you this, that God, he brought you here this morning. He brought you here to hear this message. He brought you here and you feel his presence happening in your heart right now. Ever since you walked through the door, you felt a yearning. That's God. He's been knocking on the door of your heart. And I'm going to say a little prayer. You just repeat after me. And you give your life to the Lord. incorruptible seed of God will walk through the door that you're about to open and your life will never be the same again your past is erased and you get a brand new beginning but your new beginning is not a corruptible beginning but it's an incorruptible one one in which from now on things are going to start getting better and better and you have eternity with Father God come on Praise the Lord Jesus. So I'm going to say a prayer. Just repeat after me. Everyone's going to repeat it after me, after me with you. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And I ask you, Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. And be my Lord and my Savior. Father God, baptize me in your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I love my church. I appreciate you guys. I'm just so thankful for every one of you. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed today. You know, uh, if you want to, if you want that incorruptible seed in your life, you just simply believe in Jesus. Ask him to be in your heart. Turn your life over him today. It's incorruptible. Now get in a local church. You know me. If you've watched my podcast or vidcast at all, find a local church and be involved. God bless you. If you want to... Uh, kind of knit in with us a little deeper. I would just encourage you, sow some seed into our ministry. Help us reach people. We reach people that not everyone can reach. And I would appreciate that. It just ties us together. Remember that your tithe belongs to your local church. I love you guys. I'm standing with you. God bless you. Thanks for watching.